Hey, welcome to our study in Romans. We are currently in Romans 13. And the focus of these chapters, really 12 through 16, is our walk in Christ, actually living out the Christian life. Because before that in Romans, the emphasis was on our walk with the Lord, our the gift of justification, you know, sanctification, the Holy Spirit living inside of us, a lot of these things. And now, beginning in 12, okay, we've been equipped, we've been given everything we need, now begin to live it out. And so, uh, so, uh, um, so far in Romans 12 and the first part of 13, we've talked about relationships, we've talked about responding to insults and hurts, and also last time in Romans 13, relating to the government. So today we're going to look at verses 8 through 14. Romans 13, 8 through 14. Let me read it. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Okay, let's go back to verse uh, 8 through 10. And in fact, I just want to read it again. It, it's, it's so important here. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay, so many times we see this theme of love in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament too, but especially in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, and a lot of people know this, the word that's used 90% of the time is agape love. Now, agape love, well, maybe just to back up a little bit, there are four or five different words in Greek for the word love. Now, in English, we only have one, love. And so we can talk about loving ice cream, and loving your wife, but certainly there's a little bit of a difference, isn't there? Well, this love, agape love, is God's love. It's a selfish love, a selfless love. Uh, actually, 1 Corinthians 13 is a great definition of love. It talks about, you know, uh, you know, love is kind. Love is, um, well, let me just kind of read just a couple of the things it kind of says, you know, about love. It says, uh, you know, it's patient, it's kind, it's not jealous, it does not brag, it's not arrogant, it does not seek its own, it's not easily provoked, you know, it's, uh, you know, it bears all things, believes all things, bears all things. That's just a sampling of a little bit. So as we become born again, we're told that God's agape love begins to flow into us. And the idea is, is that for that agape love then to flow out and touch other people. Now, I know it doesn't always work that way because maybe of our hard hardness, but that is what God desires to do. And, you know, the thing is, almost every book in the New Testament has at least one passage of love, you know, sometimes even more than that. And I think we can easily conclude that the distinguishing characteristic of being a disciple of Jesus is agape love. Now, 
that's important because I think a lot of times people mistakenly think, oh, that being a disciple means or the most important quality is knowing the Bible better than anyone else. Or how often we go to church or church activities. And by the way, those are good. Or 1 Corinthians 13 talks about if we sacrifice ourselves, you know, sacrifice our bodies to be burned, you know, that is real true spirituality. That's the son of a disciple. And again, that's a good thing. But Jesus says it's a godly love. Sometimes people say, you know, they think how tough and uncompromising we can be towards sin and sinners, which is actually just the opposite of love. You know, John 13, Jesus, right before he gets ready to go to the cross the very next day, uh, it's, it's in the upper room where he gathers the, his disciples together. They've had the, the last supper together. And then in, then he's giving some last minute instructions and really just a beautiful message to his disciples. And in verse 34, John 13, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I've loved you, that you also love one another. And again, he changed it to agape love here. By uh, this will all men that know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So he refers to this as a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. Yeah, it'd be great, you know, now that you're a disciple, if you tried to kind of love people. No. And, and by the way, it's not just loving those who love us. You know, uh, Jesus made it very clear that that it's loving even our enemies. And um, and if you go to 1 John, we don't have time to do this now, but uh, 1 John makes the point that if we're truly born again, we have agape love. And if we're not truly born again, there's no way that we can know it, much less have it flow through us. By the way, it says here in uh, Romans 13, uh, loving our neighbor. Who is our neighbor exactly? And and maybe I should get to mention this too, is that in the Old Testament, love your neighbor was a command, but it wasn't agape love. Now he changes it to agape love, you know, in John 13 and also here in uh, uh, Romans 13 too, you know. So who is our neighbor? Someone once asked Jesus, that actually the story goes, in seeking to justify himself, he asked, and who is our neighbor? And what was Jesus' reply? He gave the story of what? The Good Samaritan. And, uh, and the conclusion is that who is our neighbor? It's all mankind, including all those not like us. It's everybody. That's what we're supposed to do. So here in Romans 13, he says, if we love one another, we actually fulfill the law. In fact, he goes on and says, in fact, you could just sum up all the commandments by that one command, love one another. Again, with agape love. And that is not said of any other quality except for agape love. Truly, this is the, dis the distinguishing characteristic of a disciple. What are some of the things that we know about love? Well, first of all, verse 10, it says, love does no wrong. In other words, it's always the right thing to do. If you're debating on, should I love this person or should I just kind of hold a grudge against them? The answer is always, love this person. It's always the right thing to do. We're also told that love casts out all fear. 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love, again, he's using agape love. This is true godly love. It casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. You know, love has a way of just chasing away all fears. And let's face it. We live in a world where there's all sorts of fears, you know, as society, individually, you know, we're fearful of the future. We're in, sometimes we're fearful of the boss or people, but true love 
cast out all fear. We also are told in 1 Peter 4, 8, that love covers a multitude of sins. Let's kind of read that. 1 Peter 4, verse 8, it says, above all, in other words, he's talking about, if you've kind of looked at everything else, keep fervent in your love for one another. Keep fervent. That's literally, that means keep it on fire because love covers a multitude of sins. People sin, don't they? And sometimes they sin against us. And that's just part of this life. But true love covers all sin. In fact, I'm convinced that God actually allows people in our life to come in that maybe can rub us the wrong way or even offend us. Not that he causes them to offend us, but he allows them because he wants to train us in this perfect agape love. Another thing that love does, and we won't kind of go into, um, I, I can probably share this to you biblically, but let me just kind of say it here. Uh, it breaks down walls. There are intellectual walls that people put up around themselves to keep from hearing the gospel or from even just getting close to people. There's cultural walls. There's religious walls. There's walls of bitterness and hardness. Those are just a few of the common walls. But these are walls that often have been built up over a period of years, sometimes decades, and in such a way that a person cannot hear truth. They can't hear biblical truth. They can't hear the gospel. Sometimes they can't hear that someone loves them and cares for them. But agape love, and again, this is God's supernatural love flowing through us to other people. It can and it will bring down all these walls, whether they're intellectual or cultural or religious. That's why love is so important. You know, last time we uh, talked about the first part of Romans 13 and how can we truly make a difference in this dark, dark world? The answer is God's love. God's love flowing through us is what we need. Now, I know the world talks a lot about love, but, and this is important, it is impossible outside a living relationship with Jesus because that's the only way that we can experience agape love. It's got to be his love uh, flowing through us. So it's only possible, not that we're just a born-again Christian, but we're truly walking or abiding in Christ. That's the only way that his love will flow through us. You know, the uh, other day I was reading uh, um, a little review about a movie that came out to many of the theaters. I can't remember the name of it, but it was kind of like a documentary. And it was all about love and that that's what we need. And I looked at it and you know what? I didn't look at the, I looked at the review. I didn't see the movie. I should probably say that. And it looked like there, there was probably a lot of good things, at least in the trailer, that's being said about love. But I thought the problem is we can't love like this movie is advocating unless we have that living relationship with Jesus. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear and I think it's very timely in this part of Romans that he kind of says, oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. It's the fulfillment of the law. Let's jump down to verse 11 and 12. Do this, by the way, what is this? Love one another. Do this knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of God. Okay, it's time to start loving people. Why? Because the days are getting darker. It's time for us to wake out of our complacency, our comfortable routines of life, our living like everybody else. We are being called to live unlike everybody else. Actually, we've been called to live a supernatural life. And one of the main things is letting God's love flow through us. And by the way, we see this exhortation to wake up, to arise in many places. Let me just show you a couple. First of all, 
in the New Testament, Ephesians 5, verse 14. It says, for this reason, it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of, of the Lord is. Okay, uh, we're to awake, we're to rise up because the world's getting darker. Isaiah chapter 6, or not 6, chapter 60, starting in verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen on you, upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth. By the way, this is a prophetic passage. We know that by reading the rest of Isaiah 60, that talking about the deep days. So there's going to be darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. We see that already. But it says, the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes around about and see. They all gather together and they come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Prophetic of the last days that the world's going to get dark and darker and darker, but he wants to shine his light on us. And I think the admonition, admonition here in Romans 13 is wake up. It's time for your light to shine. And in context of this, it's obvious the way, we sh the way our light shines is how we love one another. Wake up. Look around you. Begin to walk in these things. Love one another. Be the people that God has called us to be. We've been called to a different way of life. A different way of life than what the world's living. And he wants us to wake up and begin to arise and begin to be who we've been called to be. It's a supernatural life. But according to Romans 1 through 8, we know that he's given us this supernatural life. He's given us a grace. He's given us, well, a lot of things. I don't want to go back and repeat everything in the first part of Romans. But uh, it, he's given us, why? That we can be a light in this world. Okay, let's look at verse 12 and 13. We've already kind of done 12, but let's read it again. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Why? Because we're children of light. We have been called to the light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. The world, as we saw in Isaiah 60, is getting darker and darker, but God has placed his light on us, wants to shine through us. Philippians 2, verse 15, says, um, we, we know this, it says, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Kind of like that behaving, you know, according to the, uh, you know, uh, according to his will, you know. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. That's right. We are lights in the world, lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You don't need me to tell you that that is happening today more and more and more. In fact, it's infiltrating every area of our society, isn't it? Therefore, according to Romans 13, let us behave or let us walk properly. That's how we become lights. We're called to love. And I, I, I envision like love is really the fuel for our lamps. Now, it mentions three things in particular where our behavior is very, very important. First, and by the way, we could talk about every one of these for at least one message. It says, not in carousing and drunkenness. 
In other words, we can't allow ourselves just to slide into a total lack of self-control, you know, loss of all self-dignity. And I think that's what happens with carousing and drunkenness and things like that. It's just that what we're really doing, we're letting the emotions of the moment and the lust of the moment to rule. And we don't really worry about the consequences that we might face tomorrow, you know, for it. And that's why it says there in Ephesians 5, make the most of every opportunity, walk as wise people, you know, uh, we've got to guard ourselves. Then it goes on and says, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. A lot we could say about that for sure. But again, I think it's talking about the lust of the moment. The lust of the moment is ruling in our lives. We don't let that happen. Because the end result, especially of promiscuity and sensuality, is always hurt, shame, ache, loneliness, resentment. It's certainly the opposite of being sober-minded and being on the alert. Let me just kind of mention a couple verses here. Um, and again, we could probably talk a lot about these. I just want to kind of read them real quick. In Proverbs 3, I'm sorry, Proverbs 5, verse 3 through 5, it says, For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as worm." Wormwood. You know, in other words, it, it tastes good at the beginning, but it always ends up. It's bitterness. Sharp as a two edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable, and she does not know it. Um, chapter 6, Proverbs again, verse 24 To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your, in your heart, nor let her capture you with your eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hurts, hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes and not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is everyone who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Verse 32, the one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. And then in chapter 7, let's just read just a couple more verses here. Verse 21, with her many, persuasion, with her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the, to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool until an arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. Okay, now those are just a few verses that, again, talk about that the consequences are never good. Hurt, shame, ache, loneliness, resentment, destruction. Okay, and then it says, and not in strife and jealousy. Now, we already kind of saw in chapter 12 that fighting leaves no winners, only losers. It destroys friendships that Jesus died to save us. But that's the way of the world. But for us, we need to know that strife and jealousy destroys peace, joy, contentment. It's not the light. It's darkness. It always is. Okay, let's go back to Romans 13. And let's look at verse 14, the last verse. Excellent summary, by the way. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. So what does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? It's, again, a lot of these things, there's a message in itself, but it's allowing his life, the life of Jesus, in me to reign, 
to control my steps, my actions, my words, my thoughts, my attitudes, every day, every hour. And it should be something, it's, it should be a daily habit, you know, actually more than daily. As we walk through life continuously throughout the day, we, we need to make a conscious uh, prayer or declaring in faith that Jesus Christ lives in me. I'm putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and I'm asking him to flow through me. And then it says, and make no provision for the flesh. Let's face it, the lust of the flesh can be powerful. We cannot stand against the lust of the flesh by ourselves. But if his life is living inside of us, controlling us, keeping us to, from following the passionate desires, then we can live victoriously. But it does mean we have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our minds. We don't give the flesh an entrance into our lives. That's what it means when it says, make no provision for the flesh. We don't give the flesh that entrance into our lives. So that means we watch what goes into our minds and hearts. That could be the conversations we have. Now let's face it, a lot of the conversations that we have, you know, they are not, they give an occasion for the flesh. TV, movies, music, you know, there's a lot of things. And, uh, and if you go before the Lord, he will show you exactly what needs to be adjusted as far as what comes into our hearts and minds. Okay, so in conclusion, we have been called to live differently from the world. We're called to be lights in the midst of a dark world, in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. We know from our previous study of Romans that we have been set free from sin and the power of sin. And now we have the love of God being poured into our hearts. I was talked about way back in Romans 5. Remember that? And it's not just to come in and fill our hearts, but it's to overflow to other people. Therefore, we are to love one another. Let's pray. Father, this whole theme of loving one another is certainly not anything new to any of us, but yet it is something that we just tend to kind of avoid. It's so easy to maybe gravitate to other areas of our Christian life where maybe we can do it in the flesh or we think we can do it in the flesh. Lord, envision us to be disciples who love one another. The least of them our enemies, our neighbor. But Lord, we need you to do something deep inside of us. And we ask, Lord, that you would do that. Open our eyes to the fact that your love is filling and wants to fill even more our lives. Lord, show us how we can let that flow out to others. Thank you, Lord. Amen.